Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and welcome to a very critical conversation that we will be having today entitled A Future Proof Nigeria Strategies for Sustainable Insurance Adoption in the Next 10 Years. 10 years because it's the 10th anniversary of the Dive In Festival. Let's congratulate the organizing team, Aeon, and everyone who has been a part of this journey over, la over the last 10 years, celebrating diversity, equity, and inclusion in the insurance um, sector. As we gather here, it's clear that insurance is not just about mitigating risks. It's about securing our future, the future of our children, and empowering every Nigerian from small businesses um, small business owners, to young professionals, to farmers, um, to women. That's really what this is about today. We're really here to explore how insurance can foster economic inclusion as well as resilience. I'm very thrilled to be joined by some of the most innovative minds in this field, and I'm super excited to be able to introduce them shortly. Um, with our to our audience, thank you so very much for joining us. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be here with us, and we really do appreciate it. We'd love to hear from you in the chat. So if you want to put your name and tell us where you're joining from, that would be absolutely wonderful. So today, our first session dives into the heartbeat of our economy, small and medium-sized enterprises that are essentially the backbone of our economies. These businesses drive innovation, they create jobs, and they also uplift our communities. The question is, how can the insurance sector protect and propel these businesses forward? Before I introduce our esteemed panel, um, there's something quite exciting and different about this year's webinar. And I'm thrilled to, I am thrilled to introduce the first ever Dive In Inaugural Insurance Champion Award 2024. Essentially, we found it fit to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Dive In to recognize a, a, a very a deserving individual that has shown impact, innovation, and commitment to advancing the landscape um, of insurance here in Nigeria. From transformative policies to groundbreaking partnerships, the champions that we have today are setting a new standard in the sector. It's my pleasure to reveal to you the nominees, if we could show that on our screen. So the nominees for the Dive In Insurance Champion Awards are Ibrahim Babalola, CEO of ETAP, ETAP, Debo Banjo, CEO of Cover.ai, Neto Ikpeme, CEO of Wella Health, Bode Pedro, CEO of Cassava, Henry Mascot, CEO of Curacel, Fortunate Anozi, Unites Africa, Ifesinachi Okoli Okpagu, CMO at Hez Insurance, Adetayo Akintunde John Fishers, the MD of First Standard Insurance Brokers, Benro Dara, speaker of ours today as well, CEO of Octamile, Alfred Ekbai, group head of AXA Mansard, also a speaker today, um, Mary Alade, Chief Strategy Officer at Aon, Ayodeji Makale, CEO of Truthware and Cube Cover Limited. So very excited uh, for these insurance professionals that have dedicated their careers to ensuring that all Nigerians have access to insurance, to financial products that suit their needs and that meet them at their point of need. So as you can see on the screen, let's give a virtual clap to all our nominees and I'm very excited to be revealing the winner at the end of today's webinar. So without any further ado, I'm very excited to be introducing the beautiful faces that you see on the screen, starting with 
Alfred Ekbay, and it's actually his birthday today. So if you want to say happy birthday to him in the chat, feel free to do so. Alfred Ekbay is a leader in driving digital transformation and strategic partnerships in the insurance industry. As the group head of emerging and new markets at AXA Mansard, he has led initiatives that protect one over 1 million lives through micro insurance. Alfred, it's really an honor to have you with us and happy birthday to you. Uh, Bengro Dara is the CEO and founder of Octomile Inc. He's transforming insurance accessibility across Africa. With over 15 years of insurance technology and e-commerce experience, he co-founded Nigeria's first digital car insurance platform and has played roles in success of African unicorns. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Benro. And the, very excited to introduce the two, two inspiring women on our panel, starting with Janita Lebras, who's a construction underwriter at Africa Specialty Risks. She brings 16 years of ex expertise in commercial underwriting and managing corporate insurance portfolios. Her insights on sustainable insurance practices are invaluable. Very happy to have you with us, Janita, welcome. And last, but definitely not least, is Raisa Hadiza. Hadiza Raisa is also a passionate advocate for sustainable economic growth through entrepreneurship and youth empowerment. She's known for her work in uplifting marginalized group, groups, and she blends her personal and professional insight to inspire change. We're very delighted to have you with, you, with us, and we cannot wait to get into it. So as I've given a little bit of an overview to how our session is gonna to go today, I would love to start with a question for all. What are your, and you know, in less than 30 seconds, please tell me what are your thoughts on the current state of insurance products in Nigeria, especially in relation to existing policies? So this is to set the tone for the rest of our discussion. Um, and I, I'll go with ladies first. Um, Janita, I'd love to hear from you. So what are your thoughts on the current states and baseline of the current insurance sector in Nigeria? Thank you, Lele. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, well, um, I, I think from an outsider, I must say, um, insurance Nigeria has been facing significant challenges and even criticism and uh, people were and still are reluctant to invest in insurance due to lack of trust, lack of understanding and I must say this is a global feeling about insurance um, but in Nigeria we, if we look at the figures we are witnessing a positive shift and, uh, and I think it's mainly la it's largely due to uh, innovative solutions and sustainable regulatory measures by Nikon. Um, but well, there's still a lot of progress made. Uh, a lot of the transformations of the types of insurances, innovative uh, di digital platforms, and so on. But I think the insurance industry still needs to be improved. Um, if we look at the, at the stats, for example, from 2020 to 2024, insurance market in Nigeria has been experiencing a steady growth. Uh, which impress, impresses me uh, from 9.5 to 35.3. If I'm not mistaken. But um, despite that, those three, sorry. Yeah, I think I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sorry, I can hear you. Your audio, yes. Um, but I, I think I, I under, understood the, the, the main points that you were making. We'll come back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to go to oh, Alfred. Okay. What okay. are your thoughts on um, the current state of the insurance um, ecosystem in 30 seconds or less? Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me. Um, thanks for the birthday wishes also. Um, so my thoughts on the... Um, insurance products today, I, I don't think they are inclusive enough. I think insurance products today in Nigeria 
um, have been built specifically for the corporate space, uh, which is where most insurance companies play today. Um, they've not been tailored to basically connect, you know, with the mass markets, the, um, the larger uh, population um, today, both from a pricing standpoint and uh, the way the benefits are also configured. Um, it is still, and also the way these products are even delivered to customers, um, as of today, we currently just design things and kind of like force it down uh, um, to customers. But I think the cost, the products can actually be better, um, could be a bit more inclusive, could actually be um, built in a way that it kind of like resonates with the key risk faced by certain individuals um, in certain um, um, areas of the economy to see how um, the insurance uh, policies can actually act as um, that financial um, buffer for customers when they have um, when certain risks potentially occur um, at the end of the day. So that, that's my thoughts on um, how the products are structured. I uh, hope I didn't go over 30 seconds. Yeah, that's <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you. Lisa, I'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the current uh, insurance ecosystem in the country? Yeah, so I think we are doing quite a good job. We do have a few products available to people. Um, it's just I think we need to put a bit more um, emphasis that we actually have this available and education so people understand, you know, what this looks like to them personally um, so that we can actually hit the mass market. I think it's helpful that we have... Um, you know, technology on our side, and we're making more use of that. So, um, yeah, that's my stance. Thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Um, and over to you, Benro, before we jump in. Um, yeah, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I, rest, I agree with everyone, with the other speakers, what they said. Um, there's been a lot of progress in the last 10 years uh, in the insurance space, despite the fact that, you know, still remains largely low penetration uh, in numbers about one, less than one percent uh, but there's been significant progress from an innovation standpoint as well uh, we see a lot of insurance tech companies also coming to sort of bridge that penetration gap gap and also improve the kind of products that are in the market um, Alfred mentioned about the lack of retail products uh, mostly focused around corporate um, we see a lot of insurance tech companies now innovating in that area and you know sort of trying to deliver a much better product to uh to, to the insuring public so exciting times ahead Definitely exciting times ahead. Thank you all to all our speakers for setting the tone for the rest of our discussion. And as you rightly uh, mentioned, Alfred, and the first question is for you, you know, you talked about uh, the lack of, of um, inclusivity when it comes to some of the products that are currently on the market. So with your perspective on the market fluctuations, uh, infrastructure challenges uh, that providers are facing, how can the insurance sector design products that address the unique needs and the risks faced by Nigerian SMEs? I thank you. Um, so the the way I see it, right, is that uh, the, the products currently um, in the market today, um, it's not like they're bad. They're not just uh, specialized for, you know, certain um, certain cadres of the population. And this has basically um, affected the growth um, in the industry in terms of number of customers engaged um, today. Um, the, the coming down to the SME space, um, I mean, products have to be simple enough. Um, these are people that, you know, actually trying to um, do their business. The economy is currently fluctuating in terms of um, the finance, um, and, uh, their people's um, ability to afford certain products. Um, and also, you know, when they're also put, um, trading, doing their buying and selling, they could buy something for cheap today and want to spend, send, sell it and then make some more money. Um, they're their margins are then cut short, you know, at the end of the day. And then looking at those things and seeing how, okay, how can we put in insurance to also ensure that, you know, certain risks are then uh, mitigated using certain products. Um, the products today, um, I mean, for, for this to be able to happen, um, we need to do some more deep dive um, into, you know, into the SME space um, to really understand what risk really resonates with. I mean, um, they're really facing. Also understanding the fact that, as I said, purchasing power is also diminishing. 
Um, and also, none of them wakes up thinking about um, insurance. At the end of the day, they only think about risk and think about their business progress. So how can we marry the two, business progress, risk they're thinking about, and put insurance in the middle as something that bridges the gap when this risk occurs, they can still progress in the business. Um, this product products have to be very, very simple. They have to be simplified um, towards the bottom of the pyramid where a lot of SMEs kind of like play in. Um, they are a bit more, you know, focused on, on it's a bit fast paced. Um, they really would not want to spend time reading the long, lengthy policy documents the way we create them today. Um, very quick, simple um, um, policies that resonate with them would, would, would be great. The products also have to be super understandable. Um, when they're reading this, we don't want to have a lot of Shakespearean English um, uh, literature in there. Um, we want to have you know, very, very simple things. Um, oh, hey, you pay for A, you get B if C happens. So it has to be that straightforward, A, B, C, very, very easily. Now, this product also has to be very, very accessible. There are a few million, there are, you know, um, certain millions of SMEs today in the in the economy. How do we get the product to the last mile? You know, addressing the concerns with the MSMEs, the SMEs, um, also the fact that they are also in different locations uh, um, today. So what resonates with an SME in the North may not be what should be in the South. How can we be more creative around, you know, the product design and also how they so also access this uh, product? then we know we also need to have a lot of flexibility um, in terms of pricing uh, um, for them. So while understanding their needs, understanding their pocket rates, we then have to come up with you know, flexibility to ensure that their pocket rate can then connect with um, um, the products um, at the end of the day, and then we're able to give them real value um, set yeah. right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you've said so much, and there's so many ways that I can, I can kind of pivot into what you said, but... What I understood from your your response is you're really talking about financial inclusion. And I think a lot of the times um, folks forget that insurance is actually part of um, financial inclusion. Just to get some stats, there's at least, according to research, there's at least 39,700,000 micro um, small medium enterprises operating in Nigeria. That data is from December 2021. So that probably has increased. So it shows you that um, SMEs actually contribute 48% of the national GDP. They are the bedrock of the economy. However, they lack opportunities to access to finance and, and the list kind of kind of um, goes on. Um, it brings me to a question, um, Raisa. I know that you uh, work a lot with uh, different types of people, um, whether it's um, at the top of the pyramid or at the bottom of the pyramid or those that are the most um, disadvantaged. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've seen um, them face when it comes to accessing insurance insurance products? And on the on the on the heel of that, could you also maybe speak about some of the cultural um, challenges that come about when it comes to the trust that is needed? for folks to have um, access to insurance. So it's a two-part question. Speak to us about uh, what you've observed in terms of the challenges that people in rural areas have in accessing insurance. And then the second part uh, would be around um, specific um, examples that you could provide for that. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Leigh. So um, agree. Um, I've had the opportunity of working with like the grassroots market women um, in the village, well, the uh, small towns uh, such as Abomosho. And with that, the, the, the basic needs of the ladies is education. They need the education that these products even exist um, after accepting that it's available. Um, so they need, it needs to be, you know, products that are very accessible through just say a simple click of a button on, on their phone. Most of them are not using smartphones, um, so it's usually through like a text or something, but they need that education to know that um, 
this, you know, they need they need something to show them that it's tangible, that they can actually use this, and it's not putting money down the drain. For example, if you're buying insurance, uh, because a lot of them, you know, it's what I can see, and most of them are living day to day. So, what is that insurance? There? Yes, you're saying I'm paying, I'm paying for this, and I get B. You know, as um, Alfred said, it needs to be as simple as A, B, and you know, for A, B, you get C. Um, so again, um, education I think would be the um, the, the founder, you know, with what they need. Uh, second of second of all, they need to um, see it working um, in action. So they need to see live examples of these things that um, you know this is. Um, someone so and so has done this, and because of this, she's been able to grow her business. So, someone is, you know, doing a chin chin business, for example, and um, buying insurance. She will, you know, ask questions: Why do I have insurance? What is going to be the benefit? Um, you know, but then she, someone comes and steals her bag of um, flour, and then through insurance, maybe she's able to get it back, or she's able to get money to then buy some her raw ingredients again. Um, um, but if she's seen that example, she's been given that example, she can then, you know, believe it and then buy into it. Um, is that part one? What was the part two? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for that. that I think that helps to set, it, set the tone for what it may be like for folks um, in, in rural areas. The second question, I think you've answered it, was surrounding the cultural challenges, right? For example, in Nigeria or in Africa, uh, people tend to shy away from wanting to get insurance because it's not it's not embodying the positive mindset um, of life. It's 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 admitting that there can be a finality to life. It's admitting that something can go wrong um, in your business, right? And I think sometimes people shy away from that culturally. So I wanted to see if you had any any thoughts on that. But if not, I'm happy to move on. Yeah, no, culturally, you know, it's what will people say, what will people think, you know, when you're putting like your finances on the table and it's like, this is where I'm spending my money and it's, I'm spending my money on this insurance. Culturally, it's like you're wasting money, um, you know, business partners or people that you're working with or influence of others saying, oh, no, you're, you're wasting your money. Don't put your money there. That's not how to do because other people don't understand that, that mindset, they bring it to you and then it makes you feel like you can't, um, you know, they shy away from it because they just think they're wasting money basically because it's not tangible and other people don't believe in it. So again, it just boils down to education. You really need to just educate the um, um, the masses to really understand what the value of this is and how you can use it to grow your business and then actually have stability and actually grow because, you know, um, with this insurance is kind of guaranteeing you that, you know, with all the infrastructure problems that we might have or whatever, you know, you're actually covered and safe. So you don't actually have to worry about, okay, I left my flower here over now at night if you're doing the chinchin or I left my, you know, and been stolen or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Thank you so much, Aisa, for providing that context. I, I think it's extremely important as we're creating insurance products to create them with the end user in mind, right? So I think that that explains that quite well. So Benra, I'd love to come to you. Um, sustainable insurance is a key um, to a is a really key to a resilient entrepreneurial ecosystem. What role does it play, and how can insurers better communicate the benefits of insurance to business owners? Um. Yeah. Thanks, Leila. Um, so I, I think for, for small businesses, for entrepreneurs, um, one of the big uh, challenges that we tend to have is um, the, the risk of external shocks, um, which could be mitigated in a lot of instances by insurance. Um, so we're, uh, it's important that insurance can address this type of uh, risks for, uh, for businesses sort of creating a, or acting as a safety net, uh, helping to shield businesses from unforeseen risks like property damage, theft, uh, operational disruptions, um, which creates financial resilience for, for those businesses. Uh, a, a good example is during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, insured businesses, we saw a case where insured businesses were able to bounce back uh, from disruptions quicker, um, there was also a case of uh, a 
um, a, a, a protest in Nigeria, the entrance protest, which a couple of a lot of uh, properties were damaged. Um, we we also saw that businesses who had insurance were able to bounce back uh, quicker. So I think that uh, as insurance practitioners, it's important to sort of position products, communicate the benefits, uh, and make businesses see insurance as. Uh, a solution to some of the, the challenges that they currently have seen as an investment uh, that actually pays off uh, as opposed to um, a, a waste of money. Uh, from a com co communication perspective, I think that there's a whole lot that can be done better uh, from creating more awareness uh, on insurance, um, leveraging digital tools and partnerships, um, going taking this communication to associations, uh, where these businesses are, these SMEs are creating tailored solutions and sort of also being able to uh, deliver that uh, communication, that value proposition uh, to the businesses. Uh, big example is farmers. How do you communicate with farmers or gig workers um, or the essence of insurance? And you know, I think also brings me to one one challenge that insurance has always had. Um, you know, because if a lot of people um don't wake up in the morning and say hey i want to buy insurance how do we then position insurance as you know um one that is relevant for such businesses uh, especially in an emerging market like nigeria and um, you know so this is one of what why you know as a, a business octama we're super excited about embed embedded insurance which you know those two things helps to uh communicate insurance at point of day-to-day uh, -day transaction so if you're buying a car buying a house taking a loan you know, it's there's active communication around the benefits or the opportunity to add insurance into that that transaction. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, you you are all sharing such great knowledge, um, and it's just great to see how um, as as leading insurance practitioners and folks that work with different people that receive um, insurance how holistic your understanding is of the different needs of the various tiers of, of, of our population. So that's definitely commendable. Um, so Janita, I would love to come to you. As we know, we're experiencing a technology boom in the world, and that's been um, heightened ever since the COVID-19 pandemic. So how can insurance companies leverage technology and data analytics to create affordable and accessible solutions um, for SMEs? Um, so, so I think we, we've well addressed uh, data and technology and how it, it's important uh, to insurance and to access an unserved or underserved uh, people in Nigeria. As insurers and reinsurers, I think we have a critical role to play in supporting um, SMEs in a sustainable manner and offering uh, solutions that are tailored, uh, affordable, easily accessible, uh, and easily communicated as well. Um, but in terms of how we could use data and tech, um, I, I think we have a lot of big data available today uh, from social media, um, internet of the devices, uh, to analyze risk, for example, to industries like gas, where there's SME uh, or farmers uh, in terms of agriculture, uh, and tap into those data industry-specific data, uh, claims that we already have, and even real-time condition to offer SMEs a deep understanding of their risk. Uh, that is how we could add value. And uh, we could also maybe use predictive modeling, which we really use today for large commercial to and tailor insurance products that actually affect reflect, sorry, their, their, their risk profile. And like all those are use, usage-based insurance models, which can help us charge premiums based on the actual data, actual usage data. And in that sense, it's like we're not, like, like today we're providing insurance for SMEs on a one size fits all, but then it would be uh, And I think that, Technology would not only help with pricing and convenience, we can actually help them prevent the losses. This is where sometimes insurance products 
don't really focus on that because we are just we just want to devise um, do the pricing and then send the offer but what about the prevention adding losses in in terms of prevention of losses so for example we could be using um, we could be using technology to monitor their assets in real time and proactively alert risks before the loss happened. Like for example, a small factory could be using sensors uh, where to monitor the machinery uh, before the breakdown occurs, uh, like a, a, a small in, in logistic can track driver behavior uh, to prevent accidents and that would be how uh, technology can be leveraged uh, eventually. And so much, Janita. we talk about data and technology. Thank you so much. I think we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So I'll come back to you. I think there's an issue with your network. But thank you so much for your points. Um, I think okay. you make some, some really good ones. Um, so I wanted to just remind everyone uh, that we will be announcing the winner of the insurance awards shortly. And I wanted to also let you know what is in it for the winner. So you, the winner will be getting a luxury custom plaque sent to your office, letting you know that you are the Dive In Inaugural Insurance Champion Award winner. You will also receive a Nariki uh, gift um, card to allow you to unwind as you wish. For those of you that don't know, Oriki is a leading um, spa, uh, spa service here in uh, Nigeria. And finally, you will get a seat at the reverse mentoring program as an exclusive mentor with Dive In. Um, so Dive In has an insurance uh, mentor mentee program, which uh, further expands on their commitment to mentoring the next generation, which we'll be, we'll, we will be speaking about later on today. So I'd like to thank our speakers so far for um, you know, speaking to us about uh, your view of the insurance, industry and the country, the challenges, and also um, some of the real life work that you've um, experienced. So as we move on to our conversation, I would love to ask Alfred, if you can share any specific successful partnerships between insurers and SMEs that you've seen that have uh, led to business growth in Nigeria. And once you outline some of these partnerships, could you please tell us what kind of lessons you believe that we should draw from these partnerships? Hey, uh, so insurance companies partnerships with SMEs are quite tricky. So for, for I mean, we see SMEs in three ways. Um, one has customers, um, two has distributors, and also has service providers um, in most cases. Um, distributors have said we would want to partner with SMEs to also be advocates within their communities. Um, if they've experienced insurance, we want to then convert them from just being normal customers to, you know, actually trying to drive uh, some form of adoption, you know, with their, within their communities to people that look like them, um, for them to be able to understand the products the way they've understood it and also enjoyed it in terms of making the claim. Um, so that's that's how we kind of like look at them as uh, distributors, um, as customers. We are also trying at AXA to move from just being a player with an SME to becoming a proper partner um, with them. So that shift is uh, kind of like what's happening now. So we want to we work with partner with SMEs in the sense of. Um, trying to understand their business and what their potential is and what kind of um, successes they also are trying to um, drive within their own space and their own community. And then see how we can not just um, offer them an insurance product to protect them when they slip off, uh, when those risks occur, but also see how we can also create some form of engagement with them um, to also help them to grow their business. Insurance is only experienced when there is a claim. It's a promise from the time of purchase. You know, so it's like people just buying, buying promises. And uh, in, in Nigeria, people, you know, could really get skeptical um, with, with things like that. So um, but when they see that they are able to get other value added uh, uh, benefits, we're then able to, you know, get more uh, performance from them. And I think finally, has service, uh, SMEs has service providers um, in 
certain instances, uh, which I'll just give a few examples uh, around, especially driving um, um, PNC um, accident insurance and also health, health insurance. We basically leverage certain SMEs to be able to um, do that last mile service delivery um, at the end of the day. So an example is um, we have created, for example, a digital bank, a digital uh, um, hospital um, at ATSA, whereby it's then backed by an insurance product and customers that acquire this product are able to get access to basic healthcare, um, proper telemedicine, medication, and you know the hospital cash. Uh, PNC uh, uh, products uh, at the end of the day. Um, looking at this, we basically deliver everything using SMEs within, I mean, using an ecosystem of SMEs, both from the pharmacy chain um, to small clinics. And um, also, we're also working with some startups to, um, who are also SMEs in, in this regard, um, to train some more health practitioners um, in different areas and then help them to build businesses that um, are then so that they can actually give la last mile assistance um, to come into, I mean, within their own communities. Um, key partnerships um, on our side um, basically would be on the on the fintech, on the on the insurtech side mainly. Um, companies, um, we have partnered with different companies to actually be distributors for us and also act as service providers. And that's how we've been um, those kind of partnerships are the kind of ones that we see within the SME space today. Thank you for that very thoughtful answer. Um, and I think it's it it illustrates quite well um, the kinds of partnerships that are possible. It sounds like technology really is the way in which insurance will be delivered um, in the future. So it's great to hear that you are experiencing partnerships with, with various industries um, and levels of access to technology. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, reaching people at their point of need and you mentioned um, speaking to them in a language that is easily understandable and digestible. And I think this is a perfect segment um, to talk about the next generation um, and how we safeguard the next decade. You know, it's been one decade of the Dive In Festival um, highlighting diversity, equity, and inclusion in the insurance sector. So what do the next 10 years look like? Uh, we know that by the year 2050, half of the African population will be under the age of 25. So young people are really the future. Um, so let's talk about our youth. Um, how do we make insurance relevant to a generation that is digital, that's online, um, that is focused on perhaps um, a lifestyle and not necessarily understanding like the 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 necessity of having insurance um how do we essentially re-establish or redefine nigeria's economic landscape um raisa i think you're perfectly positioned you know to talk about youth and um i think earlier you talked about the importance of education when it comes to communicating about insurance product to nigerian youth um, so if you could specifically tell us how you think that we could make insurance not just a necessity, but a trusted tool um, for Nigerian youth's future. How do we get young people to adopt insurance as a way of life? I mean, again, it's, it is just an um, education, but I guess the type of education um, is what would be specific here. So youth that have access to, you know, digital products and, you know, the online, um, you know, kind of putting education out there in a way that they understand it. So that's through maybe social media, short, you know, snippets of things, um, skits and whatever it is that engages them. So they actually can receive that information and receive that education. Um, and try and making uh, try and make um, insurance um, fun and um, you know you have to make it um, well we have to try and make it um, like cool right so you know having insurance is cool you have it so that you know in the future um, maybe you know with because you've had this insurance or because you've had insurance for like your car for example you can upgrade it or um, if um, for example, if they get stolen, and, um, you know, you get money back, but then it's like a, I don't know, this it's 
maybe there's an incentive there that you know um you know even though it's it's a sad thing that happened you can then with that have a way of um, upgrading the car for example so it's just making it cool in a way that a young person can say um i actually want to be a part of this and um you know make it possible i like that we have to find ways to make insurance cool um yeah. trying to relate to a younger audience um yeah you know, I think cool when it comes to insurance can look like different things. It can look like having education series on TikTok in Pigeon, right? And and, and speaking to them in a, in a language that they can understand or using local languages um, to communicate some of this information. Because I think there's always an assumption that everyone speaks um, uh, English and that, that isn't that, that is not the case. So I like those examples. Um so there's a couple of ways that we could go before I ask my last question. And I'd love to ask this to our speakers, Alfred, Barrow, and Janita. Um, as we know, when it comes to young adults and youth, um, creating safe spaces, not just for insurance, but for all aspects of life is important. Um, increasingly, young people are not just blindly uh, loyal to brands, right? They do their research and try to understand the ethos of companies before they um, kind of come on board and, and, and get some services from them. Um, so my question to you is, how do we create safe spaces in the insurance ecosystem in Nigeria uh, to foster safe spaces for young adults, to innovate, and to contribute to the development of new insurance products and services. So what kind of what kind of opportunities do you see whereby insurers can actually connect with young people directly um, to create some services that may serve them um, more appropriately than the ones currently on the market? So I'd I'll start with the... Um, with Mbero, and then we'll go to Alfred, and then finally Janita. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I think um, a good way to create like uh, safe spaces and get the uh, younger generation more uh, involved, um, like Gen Z, uh, is by actually involving them in the product creation process. Um, so I think this uh, sort of helps them to feel safer, part of the process, and not just feel like insurers are uh, offering them what they don't need. Um, this could come in various forms, shapes, like uh, creating hackathons, um, creating community events, which is just, you know, come sit, come talk, share your needs, share your experiences, and let's learn from you. Um, but, you know, be, beyond bringing them in and involving them in the process, uh, it's also important to let them see that um, insurance really is relevant from them. And <clears throat> that, that sort of brings in more of like a financial literacy uh, uh, aspect. Um, how many of these young adults actually understand the uh, what insurance is, what insurance does? Um, there's um, there's a, a very popular common joke in the insurance uh, sector in Nigeria that you know insurance in uh, non English in our local languages hardly exists. Uh, we've got to sort of speak the language of um, the younger ones, of people in uh, various parts of uh, the country and let them really understand what insurance is and what, what it does for them. I love that. Thank you so much, Meryl. Alfred? Yeah, I'll just, uh, <laughs> I totally agree with everything that Bero has said. Um, I'll just say... Um, so insurance companies are very, very brick and mortar with the way they're structured um, today. Um, and as I've said in the beginning, we're kind of like set up for mainly uh, the corporate businesses because that that's actually very, very easy markets to tap into. And that low focus on retail has basically led to what's not um, driving a lot of penetration today. Um, the real, we need to then start to tap into that uh, 
creative, innovative, tech-savvy, you know, youth population um, that we have out there today. Median age in Nigeria is somewhere around 19, uh, 19 years. Uh, it means the population is actually very young, you know, and very, and, and, and then transitioning in, um, if we start to catch them, you know, at that level, um, at that age, you know, showing them how they can actually drive their innovation, their whole fintech and inclusion, um, not just for banking and payments, as we see a lot of Nigerian youths um, going into, you know, getting them to see that, um, see success stories like Optimile, for example, uh, and so to show them that they can actually do things um, that great um, within the ecosystem by driving te using technology uh, to drive insurance, that last mile insurance, and drive retail um, at the end of the day. So um, that's that's just what I just needed to to top up. But yeah, I agree with everything Benro had said. Yeah. And thank you for that, Alfred. It's good to see that um, you know. Well, I mean, agreement is good, but it's good to see that we have the same kind of mindset when it comes to what needs to be done in the industry. It shows that um, it shows cohesion in, in thought process. And I think that's how we'll be able to see um, some real changes in the industry. So, Janita, over to you. Uh, and and then I'll go to my final question for the day. So, so um, the two gentlemen made a very good point. And what I, I would add on that is... First of all, it's about building confidence uh, for them, because if they don't have the confidence that they can innovate, that they can look into insurance, they will not be able to contribute to innovative insurance products. So but building insurance is about uh, educating them in, in terms of insurance, first of all. And the second thing is about mentorship, because we've seen that, I've experienced that like with proper mentorship, it drives you anywhere. It builds a lot of confidence. You feel supported. So the mentorship would simplify, will demystify insurance eventually. And third of, of all is about creating an open culture environment for them to be able to uh, put forward the ideas uh, eventually because insurance industry is, is a very closed segment, if I can say. We have a language that only technical person would understand, and the young ones uh, might feel disconnected with that. So that would be my my add on uh, to what I've been said already. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for that. Um, definitely agree that it should be in a language that everyone can understand. So my last question is a question I'd love for my speakers to answer in, in 30 seconds or less. It's a pretty simple question. I'll start with you, Raisa. If you had a magic wand and you could change anything about the insurance sector in Nigeria, what would it be? Um, just making it more accessible to uh, the retail market, to the mass market. Thank you. Meryl, what would you do if you had a magic wand? Um, yeah, um, Magic one, that's a tough question, you know, given that ma magic ones hardly even uh, exist. Uh, but, you know, one thing would be trust. Um, with one, one, one way of increased trust, make people trust and uh, more aware about uh, insurance. Uh, but also, I think secondly, would be to incentivize uh, digital adoption. Um, yeah. Thank you. Alfred? Uh, for me, I would push more embedded insurance um, into lifestyle products. Um, just, just taken from what has been said earlier, nobody wakes up thinking about insurance. Um, but then they think about risk, they think about lifestyle uh, products. Um, they need to feed, they need to transport. How do I fuse insurance into those things so that people can at least taste it and see that insurance actually works um, before I then offer them, them a place? And that's what I think could actually drive the right penetration. So, yes. If I had a wand, I would do more embedded insurance as a, 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 as a thing to drive awareness uh, for insurance products at the end of the day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Alfred. Last but not least, Janita. Uh, I would say I would create more inclusive insurance products to for the unserved and vulnerable population because I think we have a social responsibility towards low income. Uh, groups, women, rural areas, which, which often lack to 
lacks financial protection. And I believe that Bauer Benjamin is helping there. Um, that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janita. And thank you to all our speakers for answering um, that question. So we've come to the end of the first portion. Um, so what's going to happen now is we'll allow for a two minute um, nature break for our speakers. You can go off camera, off mute, um, and um, come back in two minutes so that we can take questions from the audience. After we take the questions from the audience, we will then announce the uh, Insurance Champion Award winner 2024. So please do stay tuned for that. And um, yeah, so in the meantime, we have a speaker feel free to go off camera or to take a bathroom break if you need it. Uh, we will come back and do four questions for the from the audience. I did want to um, just speak a little bit about the fact that this is the 10th anniversary of the Dive In Festival, and that's quite significant, the fact that uh, this has been going on for the past 10 years, 10 years of focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think this is probably happened at a time before DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion became a buzzword. So I think that's very commendable. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about Aeon, who is the main sponsor for um, this dive-in festival. Um, Aeon is the, is the largest insurance broker in the UK and plays a very pivotal role in shaping the future of the insurance industry, um, as well as they have a super uh, driven commitment uh, to ensuring meaningful change when it comes to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we've noted, they have a huge focus on youth engagement um, and, ad and a huge advocates of, um, of senior executives um, and particularly women um, in those types of roles. Um, a perfect example of someone like that is, is uh, Mary Alade, who has been working with Aeon um, and is a senior, a senior executive um, there, and she just happens to be a woman. So there's, there's, there's obvious tangible examples of people within the industry. So if you're a young person who is interested um, in becoming an insurer or, you know, joining Aon, definitely um, reach out to everyone, um, including Mary and the folks at Aon, to see what's possible there. Um, I'd also love it if our team could pull up the, the PowerPoint of the reverse mentoring um, and volunteering opportunities um, so we can leave that on the screen while we take a break. Um, and we will be back in the next um, three to four minutes. I will cue to everyone when to come back online. Um, so just a little quick one on volunteering opportunities. Uh, dive into insurance is an opportunity for young people to get into the insurance industry. And it's been launched as a part of the Dive In Festival, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion within the industry. Um, there will be partnerships with co companies like The Switch, Elba, ELBA, and SEO, as well as Reach Society. Um, and the program essentially connects uh, industry professionals with educational institutions to inspire and offer support to the next generation. Um, there's also mentoring that um, is a program that is available. It's called the Dive In to Reverse Mentoring. And it basically connects senior leaders as mentees and junior team members as, um, sorry, senior leaders as mentors and junior team members as mentees to offer and learn from one another across global location. Um, so please take a look at that. I will be back with you in the next four minutes. Um, we can take the questions at 2 p.m. West Africa time, which is in exactly five minutes. Um, so please do enjoy your nature break and I will be back with you shortly.
think from uh, from my point of view, I think um, we need to do more um, in, around awareness. Um, the the products seem a bit complex, and uh, they also just seem quite unaffordable. Um, Customers need to have more living benefits on life insurance products um, because life insurance products kind of like feel, I'll, I'll put it this way, um, we did a research um, on the market women community uh, sometime around two years ago. And uh, when we were trying to pitch life insurance to them, they kept on saying, I mean, basically what we got back, the feedback was that it had a very, very negative appeal. Something bad has to happen for you to be able to make a claim. You know, you have an accident, you know, you die and things like that. So basically, it was it basically seemed to them like they were putting their lives at risk uh, and doing this. And, you know, this is why people pray in the morning in Nigeria. And one of the reasons why we're so religious, we're basically trying to sell something to them that is against everything that they prayed for. Uh, um, when they woke up in the in the morning, so um, looking at it from that standpoint, we had to start look. We have to start looking for more um, living benefits, more non um, 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 accident type benefits um, that customers can actually get from uh, uh, added to these products, and also the price points. Um, for for the pension side, um, the Micro Health and Pension um, Act has been um, given. Adoption is still pretty low. Um, has uh, the it's not the the um, the the proceeds from the pension. I mean, from saving with the pension today is not as lucrative as. Uh, people would, uh, would expect. I think there are more, there are other things that uh, people would need to do with their funds. Plus with the way the economy is, people want to feed today. Um, telling them to save for tomorrow when they haven't fed today is uh, has really been a challenge um, for us. So coming up with a way that we can actually marry all of these things together and then come up with products that um, kind of like resonates with the customers and really speaks to their needs, um, understanding the state of the economy and how these products actually affect, you know, their the customer's appetite for the product at the end of the day would actually be um, the, the, the road or the pathway towards uh, um, um, driving the um, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfred. I'm grateful to you for bringing up the cultural difficulties that we face. And I think as Africans and Nigerians, we tend to um, have a want to follow a positive mindset. So you don't plan for the worst, you plan for the best. But unfortunately, some of these things are, are necessary just to mitigate the risk of, um, you know, of issues down the line. So I'm grateful that you brought that up. We have a question here from Marieke from Swiss Re in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, which potential B2C customer groups do you see worth targeting in the future? And would you say insurance is seen more as a luxury product in Nigeria? So Benro, I'd love for you to answer this question. Um, yeah, so I think first first part of the question, which um, demography, um, it would be a good target in the future. Uh, one that readily comes to my mind is um, gig workers, um, entrepreneurs, what, what kind of insurance products um, are relevant to them. And it's simple. It's simple. Uh, a lot of the Nigerian economy, a lot of the growth in the Nigerian economy is driven by um, entrepreneurs, um, you know, gig workers, um, and they don't seem to be the uh, one that we pay attention to mostly. So uh, this definitely will be a, a huge opportunity uh, to drive insurance penetration. Imagine being able to um, have a product that is uh, adopted uh, in mass by um, traders in a lava market, in Tejo show market, or, you know, um the the shops in the malls um that i believe that's a huge opportunity absolutely benro um i think nigeria has the benefit of having such a large population and if one is able to penetrate the the mass market um, and find a way to educate as well as uh, provide literacy on the topic, I think that that could be a potentially very successful um, population to um, to service. I think the misunderstanding that happens a lot of the times when it comes to financial inclusion, which is 
which insurance is a part of, is that this segment of the population is not a viable business case. And I think that the thinking has to has to be reshifted um, in order for everyone to have access to these products. So we have some other questions, quite a few actually coming in, which is great, which shows um, that people are finding value from our speakers. Um, the next question is from Rashid uh, from Germany. His question is, if we have to put a percentage to the population of Nigerians that has a form of insurance products, what percentage would this be? I would ask uh, Beryl and Alfred, uh, if I don't know if you have any any handy data. If not, I can pull that up. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that that's a, a holy grail question, you know. Um, there are various uh, approaches, various numbers, but I think one thing that we all agree is that, you know, uh, penetration is lower than 1%. Um, to, and but if you aggregate all the uh, number of customers uh, that you know all the insurance providers have, um, Alfred has also give you some context that uh, most of these clients are corporate businesses, uh, more on the medium and large side. Um, to I'd say, um, less than one percent, depending on the population of Nigerians that you see, uh, that 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 you you use. Uh, so it's uh, I'd say between. Uh, over five, two million uh, individuals uh, or businesses. Yeah, that's that's quite alarming uh, numbers. But yes, Alfred, go ahead. No, same same numbers for me. It's still around you know one to one point five uh, um, unique policies um, today. Yeah, within Nigeria. And uh, what we've also seen is that most of these policies are also still employee benefits. Um, it's really um, companies buying, you know, um, policies for their their um, for their staff. You know, if we add on health insurance, um, I think it takes it to somewhere around uh, three thousand four. I mean, three million, four million policies thereabout. Uh, and by the time you look at, uh, just as Mira said, depending on who's counting, you know, 200 million Nigerians, 4 million people, this is still around um, 2%. And as I said, it's really employee benefits um, more than people actually actively purchasing these products today. And I mean, it's largely because of the fact that insurance companies are really focused on, um, are less inclusive, you know, on the retail side. They're more focused on, you know, corporate business, um, trying to get um, the big box um, at the end of the day. But we believe that the winner um, in this space in the future, the leader in the future would be that insurance company that's able to crack uh, um, retail insurance um, today. And we're looking at the, the insure text to actually um, help with this penetration at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, very alarming numbers, just based on um, some quick research that I have here. According to Leadway Assurance Company, on a re research done on October 10th of last year, only 3% of Nigerians have health insurance, which is mostly, like you rightly said, provided by employers which means that 97% of people surveyed in Nigeria do not have access to insurance. Wow. Um, Raisa and Janita, would you say that this is accurate to your experience says, in Nigeria? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say it is, for example, even in my uh, household, you know, we have insurance for our staff, medical insurance, and we had to educate them on that and what that was and how to use it. Um, but other than that, none of them had insurance or even thought about it or have it for their family. However, um, because I've been able to um, um, do it for some of my domestic staff, they then uh, be, they then have then done this for their children because they've then had their education. They've seen the benefits for themselves. So they, they then used it. Uh, for and gone on to get insurance for like their um their wives their spouses or their children so through that I guess it's 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 wrong um just from my little corner so uh, but other than that yeah insurance is not something that is on the top of anybody's mind I'm so grateful that you brought up the domestic um staff aspect of it because I think that's a little way that we can all in in Nigeria 
and then in other um, African countries is, you know, start at, it all starts at home, right? So think about the people that you employ and see, you know, different ways that you could provide them with insurance or provide them with financial literacy, talk to them about savings, investments, uh, because you do need savings to be able to insure yourself or have even medical insurance. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And Janita, lastly, does this um, seem accurate with your experience? So uh, I do agree with the figures because from the reports I've been reading last December actually, and then in March and then lately, uh, all were very similar. And that's those are quite alarming figures because if we look at the Nigerian population, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the largest population in Africa. And you compare that to South Africa and to Kenya, and you got like less than 1% of uh, insurance market penetration. And then you realize that, and, and you look at the other side, SMEs, for example, forms 96% uh, of businesses in, in Nigeria. And then you, you look at the figures, it's very alarming. and. But as we, I think many of us mentioned that it starts, insurance starts at home. It starts with us, it starts with someone and then giving back, you know, giving back to the community, giving back to someone else. And I think Alfred was saying he was very fond of, of embedded insurance. And maybe that might be the solution eventually to be able to distribute the market, uh, distribute insurance instead of, having the traditional way, brokers, agents, I'm sorry for the brokers, but I mean, uh, we need to find solutions uh, to reach the market and that might be the solution. Thank you. Thank you. I love that you that you ended with a, with a potential solution there. So thank you to our incredible speakers for sharing your wonderful insights. I have definitely learned a lot today from you. And to our audience, thank you so very much for your attention and your very engaging questions. I think we can note that the journey ahead is filled with challenges and, but also very tremendous opportunities. I believe that together we can really redefine the insurance sector in Nigeria, protect our communities, but also build a sustainable future for all. I think it's important that we keep pushing boundaries, we keep being innovative, and we continue to embrace the transformative power of insurance. Until next time, please do stay inspired and stay resilient. Um, we've come to the very exciting time in our, in our session, whereby we will be unveiling the Dive-In Inaugural Insurance Champion Award winner of 2024. So I want us to all have a, a virtual drum roll. <laughs> so if you can just tap on your table <laughs> so that um, we can have a little bit of anticipation. Um, so just before we go on, if we could have the, the screen that showcases the various award nominees, and I'll read read some of their names. Um, so if the team could get the Dive In Award um, up on the screen so we can see who it is that is up for an award. So again, Ibrahim Babalola, CEO of ETAP, uh, Debo Banjo, CEO of Cover AI, Neto Ikpeme, CEO of Wella Health, Bode Pedro of Cassava, Henry Mascot of Curacao, Fortunate Anozie of Unite Africa, Ifesinachi Okoli of Pabu, of CMO of Airs Insurance, Adetayo Akintunde, John Fishers, MD of First Standard Insurance Brokers, Benro Dara, CEO of Octamile, Alfred Ekbai, Group Head of AXA Mansard, Mary Alade, Chief Strategy Officer of Aon, and last but not least, Ayodeji Makale, CEO of Truthwear and Cube Cover Limited. So now that I've announced um, our nominees, allow me to let you know who the winner is. It's my absolute pleasure to announce that the Dive In Inaugural Insurance Champion Award winner 2024 is not only, it's Alfred Ekbai, the group head of Emerging Markets and Digital Partnerships at AXA Mansard. And it's his birthday today, so that's a perfect birthday gift. <laughs> happy, bir happy birthday and congratulations to you, Alfred. Um, Thank you. <laughs> we're very proud and happy for you. 
Uh, before you. you accepting speech, allow me to remind everyone what you win by this inaugural award. You get a luxury custom plaque that will be delivered to your office. You get an Oriki spa gift card to unwind and recharge on your birthday and on this inaugural <laughs> day. And you also get a seat as a mentor in the exclusive dive-in reverse mentoring program because it will allow you to then invest in the next generation of insurance uh, practitioners on a global level. So we're thrilled to celebrate you today, Alfred, and congratulations to you and to all the nominees. Um, we really appreciate the work that you do in the insurance sector. So to close us out, Alfred, please kindly give us your acceptance speech. Uh, thank you to um, dive in for um, the for the the recognition uh, as a nominee at first and uh, to and uh, and all. But most importantly, um, thank you to everyone who was nominated. Um, I think we're all making very very great strides in um, driving inclusive insurance in Nigeria. And um, the journey ahead is still. Um, very, very long. So I would just want to employ everyone to just keep the steam um, but, um, rolling for us to, you know, ensure that we can deliver that last, last mile insurance inclusion um, at the end of the day. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Alfred, for that wonderful acceptance speech. Um, and thank you to the dive in team for this innovative um, idea. It's always great to celebrate people that are doing amazing work. So with that, allow me to close. It's been wonderful speaking with you all this afternoon. I hope that you have come out of this with more information and um, you know, a little bit of food for thought about what the next steps look like. Um, and I think it's all our collective responsibility to shape the insurance sector that we want to see. So do have a lovely afternoon. My name is Lele Balde Cameron, and thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And Happy 10th anniversary to the Dive In Festival. Thank you.